6. When Daruk was among the trees, he looked back. All was still. The air scarcely moved. The darkened village slept quietly beneath the stars. From somewhere in one of the houses, there came the faint sound of a baby crying. A voice murmured, and there was silence again. An owl hooted among the wooded hills. Daruk stood there for a minute, resting in the tranquility that he saw before him, even as gusts of fear tugged softly at his heart. Then the sight of his own footprints among the others crossing the snow awoke him to the reality of his situation, and he turned away from the village with a sudden horror and stumbled among the trees, feeling as if at any second the alarm might be given and the whole village burst forth in his pursuit. He forced himself to walk slowly, for it was so dark in the forest that he could barely see the trees around him, and the snow was no more than a glimmering at his feet. But he pressed onward, staggering where the ground was uneven, until he was out of breath and had to stop for a minute, his chest heaving, his ears straining for the least sound from behind him. He moved forward again as soon as he had caught his breath. He came after a while to a sort of path where the trees were thinner and a line of footprints was dimly visible in the starlight. He wondered whether he should try to follow the path, and then the thought struck him that these might be his own footprints not far from the village, for he might easily have circled round in the darkness without realizing it. With a sickening dread, he peered up through the tangle of branches and tried to make out the constellations. It seemed to him that he was going too far to the north, and if these were his own footprints, he must have veered to the left almost from the beginning. He felt a moment of panic at the thought that his labors had taken him no farther from the village, and the night was passing. But then he set his foot beside one of the prints that were before him and saw to his relief that his own foot was larger. The footprints were not his. He laughed suddenly as if he had no enemy in the world and began to walk along the path. He was able to go a little faster now, and although he still had to stop occasionally to catch his breath, he felt that he was actually getting stronger. It was as though the village had drained away all his strength, and now, as he moved farther away from it, his strength was gradually returning. He was still far from what he had once been, but he began to feel that to walk through the night and the day after might not be utterly beyond his power. He looked up at the stars, reassured by their calm brilliance, and walked steadily on through the darkness. He came after a little time to a deep ravine where the path with its footprints turned sharply to the left and ran along its edge. There he paused for a minute, unsure whether to follow the path, which might lead him too far to the south, or whether to try to cross the ravine and continue westward. Either course offered a delay, but the side of the ravine seemed precipitous and Daruk was wary of expending too much of his strength on such an obstacle. He decided to follow the path and hoped that it might eventually descend into the ravine. The ground had become bare and rocky, and the trees stood at some distance from one another. Dark as it was, Daruk began to feel exposed as he walked along the path. He wished that he could creep stealthily along at the bottom of the ravine, but his only hope lay in speed. If he was not more than halfway to the river by the time his escape was discovered, Atig's bowmen would soon hunt him down and shoot him like a deer. And if his escape was discovered before daybreak, nothing could save him. He walked more quickly, feeling at every moment as if an arrow were already whispering through the air behind him. Then, as he walked, he began to wonder who had made the footprints he was following. It must have been some hunter or messenger from the village, someone traveling alone along a path that was little used. He had hoped that the path might lead him directly to the road, but surely then it would have had more footprints upon it, for it had been several days since any snow had fallen. Here there was only the single set of prints going one way, and he thought suddenly that whoever had made these prints would have to return. It was unlikely that he would return in the middle of the night, and he might easily have come back already by some other path. But Daruk found himself walking a little more slowly and peering anxiously into the darkness ahead, even as he was straining his ears in the nocturnal silence that lay around him. After a while, the ravine seemed to be curving off toward the west, 
but the path went straight on over a treeless ridge. Again, Daruk paused. He knew that the road lay somewhere to the west, but in that direction, the ground was now rough and strewn with boulders. He decided to follow the path over the ridge, and then, if it continued south, he would begin to work his way westward, wherever the ground looked easiest. When he had come to the summit of the ridge, he found that the further side fell steeply away, and the path ran slantwise down the slope to the right, and vanished in a cloud of trees. He went down the path with some difficulty, and came into the darker shadow of the forest, and there he groped blindly for a while, no longer able to tell whether he was on the path, until at last the darkness became transparent again, and he saw the snow glimmering before him. He stepped out from among the trees, slid suddenly and awkwardly down a slope, and found himself standing in clear starlight on the empty road. Daruk looked around and then picked up his bundle, which he had dropped in the suddenness of his descent, and with a deep breath turned to the right and began to walk along the road. The most difficult part of his escape now seemed to be past, for he had only to walk along the road until daybreak, and then make his way through the forest until he came to the river. But he knew that in reality the greatest danger still lay before him. At dawn his escape was certain to be discovered. The pursuit would begin then, and the daylight which would open a way for him in the forest would also help his enemies to find him. He could walk steadily through the night, but his enemies would run with all the strength and endurance of the hunter, and they would not have to look far to find his tracks. He looked back at his footprints, clear even in the faint glimmer of starlight. He quickened his pace. His only hope lay in speed, and he was already weary. Time passed. The stars wheeled through the heavens, and Daruk sank deeper into the rhythm of his walking. He walked without effort and without strength, as though his legs moved of their own accord. And as he walked, he dreamed even while his eyes were staring into the darkness. He seemed to see Karat again, and to feel the touch of her hand upon his shoulder. He heard her voice, cool and direct, with that slight tremor which he thought was anger, for there was no fear in those brilliant eyes. Why had she freed him? Did she set limits to Atig's power by letting his prisoner escape? Was she in danger then? Or was her favor with that red-eyed man so great that she could not be harmed? Did she merely demonstrate her power to Atig, and perhaps even to that other? Or was it kindness? But what kindness in one as proud and intelligent as she was would make her take such risks, unless the risk was less than he imagined? They would have lost the key. And if no one told them, if no one had seen her, and she would be above suspicion. But he must not let himself be taken alive. And now he pictured her, not as she had been, but with the hood thrown back and her face illuminated by more than starlight, as though his own face were a window shining into the dark. Her countenance floated there before him, glowing softly in that imaginary light, austere and passionate, expressing nothing and yet seeming to tremble with incommunicable meaning. A scream rang savagely in the darkness. In an instant, he was at the side of the road, close under the trees, staring back where he had come from, with the hair prickling at the back of his neck. And almost at the same moment, he recognized the sound, and knew that it was only the cry of a mountain cat in the forest behind him. He exhaled slowly and quietly. The sword that cut it had given him was now naked in his hand. He could not remember having drawn it. He looked at it for a minute, gleaming faintly in the starlight, and then he sheathed it and walked slowly back to where his bundle of food and water lay in the road. The weight of the bundle as he picked it up brought home to him how tired he had become. His legs shook as he stood there, and the bundle seemed ready to drop again from his hand. It was clear that he would have to rest. He walked unsteadily to the side of the road once more and crept under the branches of a fir tree. And there, in almost complete darkness, as he lay down and drank some water and ate a little of the food. After he had eaten, he felt better, but now his eyelids began to close and a warm drowsiness began to gather him into its cloud. With an effort, he awoke and crawled into the starlight, and then he stood up on legs already stiffening and, begin, and began to walk, forcing himself to take step after step until his legs were again moving of their own accord, and the road seemed to flow smoothly beneath his feet. 
he found that he was now a little stronger, and he walked steadily along the road for several hours. But at last, he began to feel lightheaded, and his mind wandered strangely above the sound of his breathing and the remote rhythm of his footsteps. He was awakened by the shock of a sudden blow and the coldness of the snow pressing against his face. He got onto his hands and knees and then rose to his feet and looked around. He was standing under a tree. The snow before him was full of dark shadows where he had fallen, and beyond that there was the road. He must have slept while he was walking, and when the road turned, he had wandered away from it and fallen. He picked up his bundle again and struggled back to the road. He was cold now. There was a wind blowing, and he shivered within his leather coat. He could see the faint paleness of his breath spreading and rushing away into the darkness. He went and sat under a tree and ate the rest of his food. He drank sparingly of the water and then stretched out his legs and closed his eyes for a minute. He was still cold, but the shivering had stopped, and he would feel warmer when he was moving again. There was no time to spare. He closed his eyes once more and felt as if he were sliding into an abyss. When he opened them, the sky in which the stars were glittering had become a somber blue. Daruk sprang to his feet. Already he could hear the clamor of the masterless men as they rushed from the, the, their village. But the forest was silent. Even the air was motionless around him. How long had he slept? He felt well rested. He must have been asleep for hours. And although he had regained some of his strength, he had paid for it with time he could not spare. From the beginning, the outcome of his escape had been in doubt, but there had always seemed to be at least a chance. But now the empty box would be discovered. His tracks lay plain to see. The hunters would be rushing upon his trail. And how far had he come? He could not have covered more than a third of the distance that he had to travel. And now the day was upon him. He urged his stiffened limbs to a faster pace, but he knew that already it was too late. After he had walked for a little while, he began to feel more hopeful. He knew nothing about what was happening in the village. It might be hours before his escape was discovered, and certainly his strength was greater. He strode swiftly along the road with his sword swinging at his side, and the sky overhead gradually became a deep and radiant blue, and all but the most brilliant stars had vanished. All around him the world was taking shape, the great trees of the forest, leafless and evergreen, which for so many hours had been only a deeper shadow in the glimmering night, now stood forth. The massive presence of the hills rose in blackness against the ever-brightening sky, and a few clouds drifted high above the trees like wind-blown hair. A bird sang briefly in the forest, and its voice echoed among the hills with solemn loneliness. The road shone bright before him. And now the clouds kindled with a rosy light, and the sky grew pale and vast. The long shoulders of the hills began to shine faintly under the sky. A sudden wind shook the branches of the fir trees and then fell again, and all was still. The light grew stronger. Daruk could see his breath rushing and floating in the, air, in the cold air before him. For a minute, the world seemed bleak and barren in that unsparing light. And then the air stirred again, and the sun rose over the land to the east. The earth itself seemed to tremble as the westward hills sprang together into flame. The high treetops burned with the golden light, and all that lay beneath them seemed in darkness again. But the light swept on until every tree was glowing to its roots, and the level snow between them shone with an immaculate fire. Daruk sang as he walked, the words rising to his lips from deep within him, and the melody unfolding like a clear path that lay constantly before him. Morning was upon the world, and joy rose within him, until he seemed beyond all pain and loss. He walked exulting, and all around him the forest echoed with his song. He was free, and with that thought he remembered the reality of his situation. The pursuit would have begun now. He might have only a few hours to live. What was the glory of this morning if it ended in the desolation of death? By nightfall he might be a corpse hanging in the wind, he might be like Vos lying in the frozen ground, but he would not meekly await his end. Some hours remained to him, and he would use them to the utmost of his strength. Before sunset, his fate would be determined, and if he offered up his strength to fortune, he still might live. He plunged off the road into the snow. By daybreak, he should have been deep into the forest, but the sun had already risen 
and he had only now left the road. Once again, he had been slow. Now he must summon up all his speed. He floundered through the drifts of snow like a drunkard. May the great ones help me, he cried, and he sang no more. Now Daruk found that his strength was less than he had imagined. On the road, he had walked with an easy rhythm, but here the ground was rough under the snow, and each step had to be different from the last. He was soon gasping for breath, and his clothes became soaked with sweat. He was afraid to slacken his pace, and yet, however he drove himself on, he found that he was walking more and more slowly. Once he stumbled and fell, and actually crawled on his knees, and one hand for a moment before he regained his feet. At last he allowed himself to pause at the summit of a low ridge. Here the trees were few, and as the ground sloped away before him, he could see far in the distance the wooded hills, and before them, among the trees, a broad streak of white, which he knew to be the frozen river. At last he could see his goal, but it seemed impossibly remote. He looked back, half expecting to see the hunters already bounding along his trail. The road seemed to be no great distance behind him, and the crooked line of his tracks, clearly visible through the tangled branches of the trees, seemed like a mockery of his desperate efforts during the past hour. And before him, the leafless forest stretched out for more than a league, fold upon fold, to the white river and the hills beyond it. For a strong man, it was not far, but for Daruk at that time, to cross from where he stood to the frozen river seemed no easier than to fly. And yet he did it. He drank some of the water and tied the bottle to his belt, threw away the cloth in which it had been wrapped, looked back once more, and then strode clumsily down the slope before him, steadying himself against the tree trunks as he descended. And for a long time he struggled on through the forest, wading through snowdrifts, picking his way among the broken rocks, sliding into narrow gullies and climbing out of them, moving more and more slowly, looking back more frequently, and with each moment expecting to be transfixed by the hunter's arrows. But the forest was desolate. He saw neither animal nor bird and heard nothing but the sound of his own footsteps and his breathing. And at last he came out upon the shore of the frozen river and fell down upon his hands and knees. For a long time he knelt there, filled with relief and yet hardly remembering in his exhaustion why he had struggled so desperately to reach this place. Then he rose and stood on trembling legs and looked back along his trail. Everything was still. The sunlight lay indifferently on the trees and the bright snow. He turned and walked out on the ice, dreading the arrows that might fell him at the edge of freedom, yet knowing that he was free. He had reached the boundary. He was at last beyond the territory of the masterless man. The further shore of the river now lay before him like a new world. When he went up from the ice onto the snowy bank, everything seemed to shine softly with its own light. Each twig and particle of ice, each withered berry upon its branch, gleamed in the sun as though created that very morning. The air moved gently among the trees. The rocks were as though sleeping under their mounds of snow. A squirrel ran suddenly, its nails clicking upon the bark and clung for an instant at the end of a springing branch. A bird darted among the pine boughs. Everywhere, there were tiny movements, and yet all was still. Daruk walked peacefully through the forest, climbing steadily from the white expanse of the river toward the first ridges of the hills. His legs felt weak and heavy, but they still carried him, though with short, uneven steps, and his breathing was deep and regular. He began to dream again as he walked under the leafless boughs. He seemed to see Karet walking beside him, leading him forward, and looking upon him with eyes that were full of wonder, and he paused near the top of the slope to look back in the direction of the village, where at that moment Karit must be living as she had lived in the midst of danger. Through the bare trees he could see the river, flat and smooth between its banks, and the faint line of his footsteps crossing it, and then the snowy slopes fading into a haze of trees, beyond which the road lay hidden, and in the far distance the shadowy outline of the hills, but what caught and held his eye was a tiny figure moving among the trees and another dark figure close behind it, descending slowly on the far side of the river. For a moment, the cold went to his heart and he sank down quietly beside a tree, but then he remembered that he had crossed the river and he began to breathe more easily. 
He watched with a kind of fascination as they crept down the line of his tracks and came out upon the shore. He could see that they were carrying their longbows already strung. He was out of bowshot, but he instinctively crouched low and kept behind the tr trunk of a tree. Now they were standing on the riverbank. He could imagine their conversation, the annoyance in their voices, their unwillingness to return without their quarry. One of them was walking out onto the ice. Then Daruk realized that they were crossing the river. He crouched there as still as stone, and then suddenly crawled up to the top of the slope, and from his knees threw himself down the slope on the other side, rolling at first, and then scrambling to his feet and running, and then up the far side of the ravine on his feet and hands, and so to a stretch of level ground where he paused for a moment, gasping for breath, and looked back. There was no sign of his pursuers. He forced himself again to a kind of shuffling run and went on to the foot of another slope. But there, struggle as he might, he could not climb at anything faster than a walk. At the top, he rested for a few seconds and then stumbled rapidly across a broad open space of several hundred yards. Now there was another gully with steep sides. He slid and rolled to the bottom and lay there for a minute, half stunned and dizzy with exhaustion and then dragged himself up on the other side by clutching at trees and bushes. His legs seemed hardly to be his own. At the top, he threw himself down behind a tree and looked back to the open space which he had crossed. There he again caught sight of his pursuers. They were no closer than when he had first seen them. He had matched their speed, but they were running easily and strongly, even after the long climb from the river, even after running all that morning, and Daruk, was exhausted. He had kept ahead of them, but only by expending almost all of his remaining strength. He could not go on like that. In a few minutes they would be upon him, and then everything that he had done would be in vain. This day, so joyous in its beginning, proved bitter in the end. He could do no more. He had lived to the utmost of his power, and now he was at the mercy of these men who regarded him as already dead. But as he watched them running, strong and contemptuous, their bows ready for the first glimpse of their quarry, all his fear, his sorrow and despair vanished in the cold simplicity of his rage. He found himself staggering among the trees and across a clearing, hardly knowing yet what he was doing, but looking for a steep-sided ridge or hill where he might make a stand. He ran slowly but more lightly than before. His head was clear now, and his limbs were possessed of a new strength. He came over a rise and descended into a shallow vale, and he saw ahead of him the place where he would make an end. There was a great rock standing out from the hillside with trees growing on its top. Its face rose up seven feet above the snow. There he would rest for a while and await his pursuers. But he must not let them use their bows. He ran past the rock and over a low ridge, weakening rapidly, but undismayed, and then doubled back along the side of the ridge and crossed again just above the rock. He crept slowly forward between the trunks of the trees and lay there on the rock, out of sight, directly over his own tracks in the snow. He drew his sword. Now he must wait. The minutes dragged by, and the sweat grew cold upon his face and his body, and his anger became as clear and unwavering as the sky. His breathing grew slow, his limbs began to stiffen with cold and fatigue. He stretched silently, relaxed his hand upon the hilt of the sword, and then closed it again. With a start, he realized that they were already close to the rock. He inched forward and gathered his legs under him, supporting part of his weight with his hand against a tree. He could see them now. They were almost beneath him. He glimpsed their faces, drawn with weariness, and then they passed below him, and he sprang quietly from the rock. He landed behind them and cut down the first as he was turning. The second ran backwards from him, drawing his sword with the bow still in his left hand. Daruk drew his guard to one side, saw the fear in his eyes, and struck at the base of his neck, cutting deep into his chest. The man crumpled up on the snow in a fountain of blood. Daruk turned to look at the other. He was lying where he had fallen, slowly churning up the snow in his last struggle. Daruk turned away, took three steps, and fell senseless, still holding the darkened sword in his right hand.